Good morning. I hope that everyone has had a fantastic week. I hope that you have come into the sanctuary this morning prepared to worship the Lord, ready to hear a word from God's Word. And of course, uh, man, we, we just got back from camp yesterday afternoon, the youth did. And I will, I will say this, um, we had a fantastic week of camp. And I know, I know we tend to kind of say that every year, but that's just because every year just gets better and better. The Lord moves in new ways. Uh, our youth, our adults are drawn closer to Christ. You know, we're able to serve the community we go to. And man, we just have a fantastic week every single time. But this week was really, uh, really special in a lot of different ways. And I won't spoil any of that this morning. But I will just let you know and encourage you. Uh, tonight we will have our camp report uh, over in the fellowship hall. The band's going to play. Then we're going to have our camp report. We have a uh, video prepared as well to show some of the highlights from the week. And so I hope that y'all will make every effort to attend tonight to support our youth as they give their uh, testimonies about this week and everything that God did in their lives. And uh, I, I encourage you to do that because I, I really believe that if you don't attend tonight, you will miss out on a blessing because you will hear tonight how the Lord worked. And that should always be a priority for God's people is to hear how the Lord worked, to read His Word, to know Him better, and to focus our eyes on Him. So I hope that you make that a priority tonight. We will have discipleship training at 530 along with the worship service out in the fellowship hall starting at 630. Uh, we do have uh, prayer needs this morning that we would like to review and pray for. Um, new additions are the Robin Parker family, Cora May uh, Miller family, Courtney Helt, Layla Crawford, Dormian Howell family, Betty Hammond, Larry Turnage family, the West Bullock family, the Willadine Bullock family, uh, Aiden Boone, Martin Bean, Faye Brister family, uh, Ramsey Klein Peter, Mary Thompson, Ashley Williamson, and Ben Stringer. And I also ask if you have any unspoken needs this morning, any unspoken prayer requests, will you just show me your hand real fast? We can pray for you as well. Awesome, awesome. Well, this time I'm going to ask uh, Brother Sherman if he would lead us in a prayer over these prayer requests. That'd be great. We had 174 presents today in Sunday school with nine visitors and 10 in our phone ministry class. We are also going to have children's church over in the chapel this morning, so they will be dismissed during our fellowship hymn time. Also, once again tonight, 5.30 discipleship training, 6.30 worship service in the fellowship hall with the youth camp report. And then today from 1.30 to 3 o'clock, you are invited to a come and go and sip and see in honor of Lee and Chris Fan Fancher's baby, Avery Elizabeth, in the home of Hayden and Tiffany Veruki. That's 1.30 to 3 o'clock. The details are right there in your bulletin. And then this upcoming Friday, the, the children are headed out to Lake Forest Ranch. Uh, anybody who is, who is uh, kids are attending this week, we have our medical release forms for New Hope right here on the front pew. If you've not gotten one out and filled it out for this year, please do so and have it turned in and notarized by the time we leave on Friday morning and we'll get those details out to y'all whenever we leave uh, when we're leaving as soon as possible um, also so of course if you don't have children going to camp and you're kind of well that's a useless announcement for me uh, let me encourage you with one thing please be in prayer for our children and our adults as we go to camp last year last week Last week we were at youth camp. It feels like a year ago. Last week we were at youth camp, and let me tell you, we felt y'all's prayers for us. We really and truly did. And so I encourage you this week as we go, as we leave on Friday and come back on Monday, uh, please be praying for our children who are there. Pray for the adults who are there as well. That would go a long, long way. And then, of course, next Sunday, June 30th, we will have the Lord's Supper during our 1030 morning worship service. And then the Honduras mission trip is June 25th through June 2nd through July 2nd, and uh, be in prayer for them as they go. We have family who is going, Pud and Lucy Stringer is going, so please be in prayer for them. And of course, the July 4th Fellowship is Wednesday, July 3rd at 6 p.m. 
Uh, you, we will be having hamburgers, hot dogs out in the fellowship hall. We'll have games for the kids. Come out and enjoy some bingo with prizes for all ages. We ask that everyone bring either trimmings for the hamburgers and hot dogs, their favorite ice cream, or other dessert for the meal, or just bring all three and that will work too, okay? That will work too. All right, that is all the announcements I have for this morning. Uh, if you please just pay attention to the bulletin, everything's going on there so you can stay up to date with what's happening in our church. And please, uh, please get involved. That's all we ask. We want you to be involved. We want you to serve the Lord alongside us. And we want to see the Lord work in your life in that way. This morning, I'd like to read one verse. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It was one of the verses from this week at camp. And it says, Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. And we'll go to verse 20. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. Repentance is something we often think of as only happening one time in the life of the believer. We repent one time when we first come to know Jesus. But the truth is, is that repentance is, it happens that one time, and that's that's the moment that God's grace and mercy Uh, floods your heart and your life, your soul and brings your dead soul back to life and you receive the forgiveness for your sins but also repentance daily for a believer is also important because even though we're forgiven of our sin when we are sinning and we are not repenting even as a believer, we do falter and we do hinder our relationship and our walk with the Lord so my encouragement would be just to for you uh, number one, if you have not repented first of your sins ever, uh, that's the first step in the process But also the second step, if you are a believer in Christ, I encourage you to remember to repent daily of your sins, to turn away from them so that you can have that fresh and vibrant walk with Jesus. If you would, allow me to lead us in a word of prayer, and then we'll move forward in our service. Father, we thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to gather here today. Lord, we gather as unworthy people who have sinned against you. But also, God, we gather as people who you see as forgiven, who you see as saints, who you see as holy and beloved, redeemed and restored. And so, Lord, even though we humbly come to your throne to worship you, God, we know we also come boldly because of the blood of Jesus that he covers us. Help us to be bold in our worship this morning. I'm sure that many of us have faced obstacles and trials this week. But Lord, those obstacles and trials, they do not matter when it comes to whether we can worship you or not because you are always worthy. You are always holy. You are always good, even when we don't feel like you are. God, your truth declares that you are good. And God, you are worthy of every shred of praise and worship we can give to you this morning and also tomorrow and also the rest of this week. God, you are worthy. Help us to do so today. God, we pray for our children's church as they, the adults, the students who are over there. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be with them, that you would help Courtney to lead and to teach your words accurately and effectively. God, we pray for this morning. We pray for Brother Eric as he leads us to your throne of grace. God, we pray that you would help him to do so with a right, with a right heart, clean hands, pure heart. And Father, may he give it all he's got this morning to lead us to the throne of grace. May we give it all we've got in response to that. May we worship you, keeping our eyes on you. And God, also help, I also ask that you would help me to preach your word this morning. Lord, I am tired and I need a boost of energy to get your word out there the way you want it done. Please help me to do so. We thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us on the cross. We thank you for allowing us to gather in freedom today to worship you. And it's all by your name I ask these things. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Let's stand together. I want you to take a minute and greet each other. Children, you can go to Children's Church.
sing together this morning. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we honor and adore you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we worship you. Seventy-seven will be our offertorium. You can remain standing. Five seventy-seven.
Thank you, ladies. As we continue, you can remain seated. We'll sing 535, 599, and 502. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer. Oh, 
heaven comes, I want to I want to kind of sing a new one in our hymn book, hymn number 244. I say it's new. If you look at the bottom of the page, it was wrote in 1931. But it is new to me. How many of you know this song? 244, Calvary Covers It All. 1931, and nobody's ever heard that song, right? Who knows it? Anybody? Shoot, I was going to get you to come lead it. <laughs> Let's sing the first and the last. We'll try it together, okay? It's a beautiful song. Listen to the, pay attention to the words of it. put that one in the computer, don't you think? That one's a good one. I like that. Calvary covers it all. So during the summer, there's a particular piece of fashion that always seems to make its way back up to the forefront, and that is shirts, pants, bags, purses, hats with a long-legged pink bird on it, a flamingo. Have you Have you any of you this summer seen a flamingo shirt or flamingo swim trunks, bags, anything like that yet? Okay, like it's okay to raise your hand. I'm not gonna. Okay, I'm not gonna like. Where did you see it? I'm not gonna do anything like that. Okay, all right. But uh, over the past, we went to Branson several weeks ago, and and we saw all these flamingo shirts and and flamingo bags, and of course we ended up buying some. Well, I didn't buy any. Hannah bought some. And, uh, but one day at Branson, the night we went to go see Elvis's cousin perform the Aloha in Hawaii concert, um, we all, it was me and, then, and her family and then um, her twin's fiance, Rhodes, uh, we all wore our flamingo t-shirts. And, you know, so I've just been thinking a lot about flamingos lately. And I have a, I have a little bit of a joke for y'all. I hope that you find it funny, but don't feel like you're obligated to laugh. But there was a, a flamingo family. So you had a mommy flamingo, a daddy flamingo, 
a boy and a girl flamingo. So there's four of them all together. And the boy and the girl flamingo, they were doing what kids do. They were arguing. They were bickering. They were fighting back and forth with one another. And the mom flamingo comes into the room and says, Do not make me go get your father. Of course, the kids, as kids do, will stop for about 10 seconds and then go right back on to fighting. So the mother had went to the living room where the father was and told, them, told him, You need to go get your children. They were acting like hooligans. Go get them, take care of them, whip them, do whatever you got to do. So he goes into the room. And he looks at his two children, his two little flamingos sitting there in the floor fighting. He goes, do not, do not make me put my foot down. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, okay, so, so, flamingos, foot down. Okay, <laughs> y'all are great. Oh, my goodness. Next time, yeah, I'm going to, don't make me put my foot down. That's what I'm going to do it next time. <laughs> Where's Lee at? <laughs> oh, man. Y'all are, y'all are too much. Y'all are great. Oh, man. Hey. Amen. So I wrote this manuscript this week while we were at Infuge at Mississippi College over in the Clinton area. And uh, you may notice the title behind me. It's called Jesus Rejected. It's going to be Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. And our our subject for this morning, we're going to get into it, but ultimately it's going to be about faith. It's going to be ultimately about faith. Um, This is one of those sermons that contain lessons and, and truth that I had to learn and apply to my own life as I prepared. And honestly, though every sermon I prepare always is like that, right? I'm always learning and trying to apply whatever I'm teaching or whatever I'm learning. And this happens weekly for the youth as we go through different series. Which, by the way, on Wednesday nights for the rest of the summer, we're going through a series with the youth called Jesus Unchained. And we're talking about the hard sayings of Christ and how we apply those in our lives and how we faithfully follow Jesus in those sayings. And so... Push that with your youth, with your teenagers. Let them know that that's what we're going through this summer. We're making disciples, right? And so, but I, I, I tell you that even though every sermon I prepare always has some truth that I have to learn and apply in my own life, uh, this, this, is one of the, this is one of the ones that I feel is like special, okay? This is one of the ones I feel like is special. Because the whole week we were at Infuge, and the whole week I was doing this sermon prep, and the whole, like... The, the application of the sermon and the sermon prep was almost going hand in hand together. It was about faith. And we're going to get into that in just a second. And as I was doing the sermon prep for today throughout the week, and I only, so most of the time when I do sermon prep, I take two days out of the week, sit down and dedicate four, six, eight hours to it, however, however long the Lord wants me to do it for. But this week it was kind of, I was doing sermon prep during our hang time, during our free time. And so it was only 45 minutes to an hour at a time. But all throughout the week, as I was doing the sermon prep, my heart was overflowing with joy and worship to the Lord. Because while I was doing this sermon prep, while I was learning the things of the sermon, God was doing these things at camp. And it was absolutely astounding. We had a great week at camp, and I can't, I can't overestimate that. I guess I underestimate that word or that feeling whenever I say great. It was fantastic. Seeds were planted. Uh, the gospel was proclaimed. We reached out to people for Jesus. We saw people come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. We saw people repent, even in our own group. We saw several rededicate their lives to the Lord. We saw a, a harvest of spiritual fruit. Heaven rejoiced, and my heart rejoiced alongside the heavenly host this day week. But that is not where the worship stopped. Of course, it continues on today. As we reflect tonight about what God did at our, at our camp this week, we, we rejoice. We rejoice. I'm thankful that God's Word is living and active and is still being used by God to mold us into the image of His Son. Like I said before, the text we are studying today is Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. And the text that we are studying simultaneously challenged me and encouraged me, and I am excited to open up and divide the written word of God with you today. 
See, the reason for this excitement, the reason I was challenged and encouraged is because the focus of our sermon is our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What is faith, though? Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 6 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, and without faith it is impossible to please Him, being God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Another way of putting it might be that faith is the belief and trust in someone that cannot be physically seen. For the Christian, faith means believing and trusting in Jesus with everything that we are, taking His word seriously, believing His every word and action to be true. What that looks like is we trust that Jesus is the Son of God, that He was crucified, buried, and resurrected, and that if we repent and confess our sins to Him, we stand forgiven. Faith is taking God at His word. R.C. Sproul once said, the very essence of faith is trust. Do we trust God? Do we take Him at His word? Back before I was born, you used to be able to give a person your word, and they would take you for it. Now, whenever you want to enter into an agreement with somebody, you have to fill out a stack of paperwork and put your signature to it. But do we take God at His word? See, if faith is believing and trusting God, then the opposite of that is disbelieving and distrusting God. We're going to be real simple this morning because I'm a simple person. What happens, so what happens when there is a lack of trust and belief in God? That is the point of today's message. Today we're going to examine a time in the scriptures when Jesus returns to His hometown only to find that there is a severe lack of faith there. Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. I want to share a bit with you on the context of today's passage before we dive into it. The first thing is the book of Mark itself. The book of Mark is an action-oriented gospel book. That is actually the only gospel book, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark is the only book written to believers, right? It is the only book written to believers in Christ. Matthew, Luke, John, they're written to non-believers for the sake of of lost people reading and, and coming to know Jesus through their writings. But Mark, the Gospel of Mark, is written to believers in Christ. And it's written for the purpose of discipleship. It is written for the purpose of showing us what Jesus did, what his disciples did, and for us to follow in those footsteps. There are teachings about Jesus found throughout the book, but one of its main focuses is the actions of Jesus. See, one thing you'll notice about the book of Mark when you read through it, you do not find Jesus or his disciples sitting idle in this book. They are constantly moving and doing, performing miracles, feeding the multitude, proclaiming the gospel, so on and so forth. And it serves as a reminder for us today that we, in the same way, are called to be people of God who take action. We do not sit idle in our faith. We push forward the gospel. We move forward in discipleship. We do what God's called us to do. And now, so more specifically, Mark 6 is found within the context of a passage of, of, of Scripture that really starts in Mark chapter 4 and goes on that is centered around the authority and the power of Jesus. In Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, Jesus displays his power and his authority over nature by calming a great storm. Followed by the fifth chapter, Jesus drives out a demon named Legion into a herd of pigs. And then the healing of Jairus' daughter. By the way, Jairus is one of the rulers of the synagogue. And so we see from the earth to the spiritual to the unclean and to even in the life of religious leaders, Jesus reigns supreme. That is what we see when we look at those passages in the book of Mark. Mark is telling us about Jesus and that he reigns supreme. But in the beginning of the sixth chapter, almost tucked away into five or six verses, we find one little village that didn't believe that Jesus was really supreme. We find one little village that will not submit to the authority of Christ. They won't trust him, and we see that it has some really negative consequences on their village. This village is his hometown of Nazareth. Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 1, going all the way to verse 6. He, being Jesus, went away from there and came to his hometown. 
and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph? Maybe some of your translations say Joseph. Both are correct. And Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us as well? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said in verse 4, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And then he went about among the villages teaching. Pray with me. Father, we pray that your word be living and active still to us today. We know that it is. The Lord help us to feel that. As I preach your word this morning, God, I pray that it would be you who speaks, not me. May you be honored. May you be glorified. And may our hearts and our minds receive this word that you've given to us this morning. May our faith in you be true as we plunge forward into the scriptures. It's by Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. See, I cannot but try and place myself in the shoes of Jesus at this moment. Could you imagine returning to the place you were raised and finding that most everyone there has, has, has really turned their back on you, has stopped believing you, has stopped trusting you? See, this is Jesus' hometown, the place where you would think he would have been welcomed and embraced the most out of all the villages he's been to. You would think that because they were raised with Jesus, because Jesus was there and he grew up among them, you think that when he returned to his hometown, he would receive a welcoming party. You think that they would receive him, that they would receive his words, that he would be able to do mighty works there. But no, that's not the case at all. He returns home, begins teaching in the synagogue, and what happens next? Firstly, we see that they are astonished at his teachings, even going so far as to ask the question, where did this man get this wisdom? We see throughout the scriptures many times when Jesus is teaching the people, and the people are astonished at his teaching, and that leads them to trust and believe in him. But very quickly, though, the questions raised by the people of Nazareth take a negative turn. In verse 3 it says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? The brother of James and Joseph and and Judas and Simon are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And this brings us to our first point this morning. By the way, this sermon is like a longhorn steer. There's two points and there's a lot of bull in the middle, okay? So we got two points this morning. Jesus' divine authority was rejected in Nazareth, Nazareth due to their familiarity with him. Jesus' divine authority was rejected in Nazareth due to their familiarity with him. Verses 3 through 5. The people of Nazareth, like I said, were the ones who grew up with Jesus. They knew his parents, although apparently they did not know his heavenly father. They knew his siblings. They knew him. They were, they were familiar with him. And if I had my guess, they probably knew lots of little details about Jesus, like through his childhood and adulthood years. Adulthood years, that's a new word, right? They probably knew where his favorite places in the village were. They probably knew what he liked to eat, what he liked to do. They were familiar with the details of his life when he was raised there. They knew him. And yet we see in the scriptures they really did not know him at all. They didn't recognize his heavenly father when he taught them in the synagogue. They didn't pick up on the anointing of of God in his life. They didn't understand the power and the wisdom of the words that he taught them. They, They marveled at him and they took offense at them. And they ultimately did not recognize his divine authority. While they pointed out the uniqueness of Jesus' preaching and teaching, they failed to act upon it correctly. The wisdom of his teachings led them to disbelieve and ultimately reject his authority. But why is that? I think it's because they couldn't believe that Mary's son really could be the son of God, the Messiah the Redeemer, the Savior of the world. They just couldn't believe that. They were familiar with Jesus. It is totally possible, New Hope, to know enough about Jesus and still not know Jesus. It is totally possible to see Jesus as a good teacher 
as a good preacher, as a good person, heck, maybe even as a prophet. Sorry, I should not have said that. And still utterly reject his status as the divine son of God. See, a lot of atheists, maybe even a lot of unbelievers in the world today, they see Jesus as being a good person. They see Jesus as being a great teacher. They see Jesus as being a great miracle worker. They even could see him as being a prophet. The Muslims believe that Jesus was a prophet, but they refuse to acknowledge his divinity. They refuse to acknowledge that he was the Son of God. They, they fail to pick up on that which was most important about him, that he is the Son of God. They were too familiar with Jesus. See, like I said, it's totally possible to know enough about Jesus and still not know Jesus. It is possible to read the Bible and all the words about who Jesus is without ever accepting the truth and the reality of who Jesus is. Being familiar with Jesus does not mean you know Jesus. And let me explain it this way. Uh, I will try and, and kind of uh, bring it to my level, right? So I know several lyrics to different songs written by different Christian rappers and artists, and I've, I've known these things throughout the years, right? So I can recite to you Andy Minio, Lecrae, 116, KB, Tadashi, NF lyrics all day long. I can do that. In fact, I thought about, earlier this week, I thought about rapping one of them, but then my voice this morning, I can't even hit a high note right now, so we're not gonna have, but that's not going to happen. It was the Lord telling me no. But I know there's songs. I can do the same for a lot of David Crowder songs. I've seen David Crowder, Lecrae, Skillet, Mercy Me for King and Country, several other Christian bands in concert. I am totally familiar with those artists and those songwriters. But that does not mean I know them. That does not mean I have a relationship with them. In fact, if I were to go up to David Crowder and be like, Hey, David, how are you doing, man? I love that last song you got. He would not say, Oh, Evan, how are you, man? Yeah, thanks for those. No, he'd be like, Who are you? Even though I know so many details about this person's life, he doesn't know me from Adam because he doesn't know me. If you were to go up to one of them and say, Hey, do you know, do you know Brother Evan Sheridan? They would say no. And even if they knew me, they'd probably, ah, I know, that guy's kind of weird. No, I don't know him. Even though I'm familiar with them and their music, I do not know those artists. I do not have an active relationship with those artists. They don't know me. I don't know them. See, the people of Nazareth knew all about Jesus, but they did not know him truly. They were familiar with him, yes, but they did not know him. See, one thing that our speaker this week, uh, Paul Cunningham, said, he said, you can uh, have proximity to Jesus, but not intimacy with Jesus. What that means is you can know all about him and still not have an active relationship with him. They grew up in proximity with Jesus, and yet they had no true relationship with him. They did not understand his true nature. And remember the context of the text we're looking at this morning. Mark is a book of action. And over the last few chapters, the human author of Mark, which does anybody know who the human author of Mark is? It starts with an M. Mark, yes. All right. Mark focused in on Jesus' authority over these last few chapters. He wrote down the wonderful things that happen when we believe Jesus, when we take Jesus at his word. But in this passage, he shows us what happens when we are familiar with him, but do not know him. And this brings us to our second and final point for this morning. Jesus' rejection in Nazareth led to a very small projection of the power of God. Jesus' rejection at Nazareth led to a very small projection of the power of God. Verse 5 reads this, And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Verse 6. See, up until this point, Jesus has been doing some incredible works. 
A brief reading through the book of Mark shows Jesus healing people, driving out demons, cleansing lepers, uh, calming dangerous storms, feeding thousands of people with, with but just a few fish and a few loaves of bread. And we see him walking on water. We see all these things that point us to his authority and his power. See, Jesus is powerful and he is mighty. And when he moves and when he works, he moves and he works. And it always increases the faith of the witnesses. God loves for us to act in faith and to trust Him with all that we have. And the result, or maybe according to Hebrews, I should say the, the reward of this type of faith is the powerful outward working of God. Now, let me say this too. This is not to say that God needs our faith to do powerful things. He doesn't need anything about us at all to do mighty works. We were not around when he spoke the universe into existence. Y'all remember that? We were not around. He didn't need us to be there. To, yes, God, you can go ahead and create the earth now. I believe you can do it. No, it wasn't anything like that. He can do powerful works all on his own. He is not limited by our lack of faith. And he is not, he is not pushed forward because of, the, uh, because of how much faith we have. But by our faith, he moves and works on our behalf to further his own glory. The subject of what God does and does not do based on our faith is a subject for another morning. But the fact of the matter remains is that when we trust in the Lord, big things happen. He rewards our faith. We see that example throughout the Bible. We see it in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 to 13, when we read the story of the centurion who comes to Jesus asking him to heal one of his servants. And when Jesus says, yes, I will come, I will go to your house and heal him, the centurion says, no, 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 you don't have, I'm not worthy of you to step under my roof. On, roof. Only say the word, and I know he'll be healed. Only say the word, and I know you, that he will be healed. The centurion responds, of course, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word, my servant will be healed. And immediately after, Jesus heals his servant because of their centurion's faith in him. In fact, Jesus even says, I have not found a faith like this throughout all of Israel. And yet a Roman centurion displays great faith for our example. We also see that fire rained down from heaven in 1 Kings chapter 18 when Elijah faced off against the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. By the way, one of my favorite little details of that passage, of course it's all really great, one of my favorite little, little zingers in that passage, I guess, is when the prophets of Baal were sitting there calling on their God, and they got to the point where they were cutting themselves, and they were harming themselves, and they were just doing all they could to somehow get this false God to move and work on their behalf. Elijah's sitting over there and going, hey, uh, maybe you could try doing it a little louder. He might be sitting on the toilet or something. Maybe he just can't hear you at the moment. And it's like, a, it's like a, just a jab at, at the, the, the idolatry that's going on. We also see the example of Moses in Genesis 6 when he built the ark and survived the flood. The example of David in 1 Samuel 17 when he faced off against Goliath. Let me, let me read it to you. Uh, verses 32 through 37, 1 Samuel. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with his Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. And he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. By the way, just imagine that imagery of David, a young boy, grabbing a lion and killing it with, by the beard. That's pretty cool. Um, your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be, one, shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And David won the battle that day against the Philistine. Great faith. Examples of faith are found throughout the entirety of the Bible. This was just to name a few. God rewards the faith of his people. But what happens when God comes knocking, but the people refuse to accept him? He doesn't move. Very little power of the Holy Spirit is put on display for others to come and believe. And it is still this way today. I recently finished Nick Ripkin's Insanity of God book. 
It is a book about one man's journey to learn about how to make disciples in countries that are utterly hostile to the gospel of Jesus. And in each of his trips to all these different countries all over Africa, the Middle East, Russia, Asia, he finds that Christianity is not waning because of the persecution, but rather the church is growing because of it. And it's not growing in small little bits and pieces. It is growing drastically. Why? Because the people there who are living under persecution believe that God is able to move. I recall the story of one, uh, one man in his book, a Russian by the name of Dmitry, who lived during the time of the Soviet Union's era. And the Soviet Union would hear about these house churches come up, and they would arrest the leaders of this house church, and they would throw them in jail. And so Dmitry was one of these, and he got put in this jail with 15 other, 1,500, not 15, 1,500 other hardened criminals. And every morning, Dmitry would stand up, he would face the east, and he would sing a song of praise to God. And while he was singing the song of praise, the other criminals would be jeering him. They would be mocking him. They would be throwing things at him. They would be insulting him. The guards would hear him sing, and they would come in, and they would beat him for his faith, and they would threaten to kill him. Every time Dimitri would find a scrap of paper or a piece of charcoal out in the prison yard, he would sneak it back to his little prison cell, and he would, he would write out whatever scripture, whatever worship songs that he could remember, whatever stories from the Bible he could remember, he would write it. And then he had this little post in his room that kind of connected to the wall and the ceiling, and he would put it on that post as an offering to God. And the guards would come in, they would see that paper, they would immediately take it down, and they would continue to beat Dimitri, and they would threaten his life. Well, one day, Dimitri just couldn't take it anymore. He said, I'm, I'm giving up. If I, the guard said, if you recant your faith in Christ, we'll let you go, and you'll be free. And there came a point after years of this where Dimitri said, I give up. I can't do it anymore. So he told the guards of what he was going to do. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll sign the paperwork recanting my faith so I can be let go. See, previously, by the way, I left out this little detail. Previously, the guards had told him that his family was dead, that they were killed. But that night, about a thousand kilometers away from that prison, his family had a leading from the Holy Spirit that they needed to pray for Dimitri. And so his brother, his wife, and his two children gathered into their living room, got down on their knees, began praying out loud for Dimitri. And somehow, by the Holy Spirit of God, Dimitri that night heard the prayers of his family. The next morning, when the guards came in with the paperwork, Dimitri looked them stern in the eye and said, I know that my family is alive. I heard their prayers last night. I have faith that God can move and you will not move me. They then took Dimitri out of his cell, beat him to within an inch of his life. But while they were beating him, the other 1,500 hardened criminals were standing by their bedside singing praises to God. God is still at work in today's cultures and countries, even where they are hostile to him. Even when they are hostile to him. At this point, I want to bring us to us who are sitting in the room this morning, right here, right now. Do we consider ourselves to be people of faith? What I mean by that is, do you believe in Jesus with everything that you've got. See, I've kind of noticed a pattern in our culture today. This is moving from us to, of course, the larger picture here of American Christianity. But I've noticed that there is a pattern of powerless ministry from our churches. While God is doing big and mighty things in all these different countries all across the globe, it seems that Christianity in America is fighting on the back of its heels, meaning that we are losing ground in our culture. And I cannot help but wonder if it's because of a lack of faith among believers in Christ today. Have we become so familiar with Jesus that we substitute our knowing about him for knowing him? Have we become so caught up in work and sports and hobbies and entertainment that following Jesus has become just a side gig for us? Throughout the week do we live to ourselves, but Sunday we put on our mask and come in and we worship the Lord? See, a lot of the reasons why we face or we have powerless ministry in our churches today is because there is a lack of faith among the people. And I don't say that to condemn anybody. I say that to help us realize where we stand. If that shoe fits, wear it. 
See, the main push of the message this morning is not to inform you about faith, but rather to use the Nazarenes as an example for us. Where is our faith this morning? What is it in? My old pastor used to say, if you want to know uh, where a man worships at, where his heart is at, you look at his wallet and you look at his calendar. You look at what he's spending his money on and you look at what he's spending his time doing, specifically his free time. Is our faith in Jesus truly and wholeheartedly? One thing that Paul Cunningham said this week that really resonated with me at the last day of camp, the youth will remember this, he threw up a pie chart on the, uh, the screen and said, uh, if, if you don't follow Jesus in every area of your life, meaning work, school, family, so on and so forth. But the only time you follow Jesus is when you're like at church and then when you read your Bible and when you pray and when you go on like a youth trip and a mission trip. You know, say you do all those things and say all your quiet times every day last about 30 minutes to an hour. Then by the end of your life, you would have only spent, was it a life or a year? It was a, it was a year, thank you. Uh, then at the end of the year, 365 days of doing that, you would have only spent about 8% of your time actually following Jesus and 92% of your time doing other things. And that's when he brought the point to say, uh, so it's not about just doing things when what the Lord approves. It is about getting other areas of your life under the authority and power of Jesus Christ, including our work, our families, our schooling, our relationships, our sports, our hobbies, our entertainment, so on and so forth. It is about bringing those things under the reign of God and allowing us to influence them for Jesus. If you want to follow Jesus truly and wholeheartedly, you must follow him faithfully, daily, and watch him do many great things in our communities. And listen, it is fine to spend time in the Word of God. That is great. We encourage that. But don't just stop there. Take what you read from the Word of God and apply it to your days as you go out day to day to day to day to day. See, I believe that if we would do that, you hope. I believe that if we would be faithful to bring Jesus into every area of our lives, then our communities, our churches, and our families would be utterly transformed for the gospel. If we would know him as Lord and Savior rather than know about him, man, we could see some awesome movements of the Holy Spirit. See, we can have all the head knowledge in the world when it comes to Jesus and still be just as lost as we were before we even heard his name. Knowing Jesus is more than affirming facts or doctrinal statements. Knowing Jesus is about being in a personal relationship with your Creator and striving daily to follow Him. Knowing Jesus means being unashamed when He calls you to give a witness. Knowing Jesus means picking up your Bible on a daily basis rather than just on Sundays or Wednesday nights. It means spending time with your Savior in the Word of God and in prayer. Knowing Jesus means doing ministry and the example that He has set for us. Knowing Jesus genuinely produces a desire to share Jesus with others because knowing him really is that sweet and that awesome. Knowing Jesus means to know that when you draw your last breath on this planet, you'll wake up in paradise with your Savior. I don't know about you, but I want that power of God to be evident in my life. I want people that when they see me they see Jesus. And I know that's a lot easier said than done, right? Because I have a feeling that most of us, if not all of us in that room, we resonate with that, right? Because we know we want to be a part of something bigger than who we are. We want to, to be known as when people look at us, they see Jesus. But that is always easier said than done. But we do so by knowing Jesus. The more we know Jesus and be in a relationship with him, the more we'll be able to faithfully follow him in his example, and the more that when people look at our lives, they will see him. See, we experienced the power of God this week at camp with our youth, and we're going to learn about that a little bit more tonight. But my question, though, as we come into this time of invitation, my question, though, is this. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Or have you been using the fact that you know facts about him as a wall or as a way to hide the fact that you really don't know him at all? He died on the cross for us so that we could be saved from the condemnation of our sins. And 
I pray that every person in this room would know that sacrifice, would know of that love and that grace and that mercy by repenting of their sin, maybe for the first time today, and placing their faith and trust in Him. As our musicians come forward, I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then we're going to have an invitation, and we'll be finished for today, for this morning. Father, we thank you for another day. Lord, as we come into this time of invitation, help us to be honest with you, with ourselves, with the folks sitting around us. Help us to be honest about where we stand with you. Because, Lord, there is no more important detail. There is no more important thing in our life than knowing you as Lord and Savior. We cannot substitute knowing you for religion. We cannot substitute knowing you for good works, good deeds. We cannot substitute knowing you for good intentions. Or there is only knowing you. And I, my heart's prayer, God, is that every person in this place knows you. That they not only know about you, but that they know you, that they have a relationship with you. If not, I pray that you would convict them where they are. That they would be unashamed to respond to your leadership today. And God, I thank you for this opportunity you've given us to be in your word this morning. I pray that you would see you that you would use it as you see fit. And we thank you so much for the cross, Lord. Knowing that it was upon that cross our sin was atoned for. And that we accept that gift by placing our faith and trust in you. Help us to do so this morning. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please stand?